What's up, folks? What's going on? Welcome to episode 67 of the Spun Today podcast. I'm your host, Tony Ortiz. Thank you very much for taking a listen. In this episode, I'm going to speak about a shit ton of movies and documentaries and stand-up comedy whose only through line is the fact that I ingested each and every one of these with my eyeballs (laughs) the movies that i'm going to speak about include morris from america the accountant becoming warren buffett the founder moana and dr strange i've seen a way too much shit since the last time i did one of these uh, random rants um the stand-up comedy includes neil brennan's three mics felipe esparza's they're not going to laugh at you. And Bill Burr's Walk Your Way Out. If you're... If you think you're... You'd be interested in... I guess my... Uh, perspective or my... Uh, my... I guess... What I thought of each and every one of these things. Whatever. Any of my thoughts? Then stick around. If not, then... Uh, check out one of the backlist episodes of the Spun Today podcast, which there are 66 other episodes of. All right, so since there's so much to get through, uh, I'm going to jump right into it. Morris from America is an American-German coming-of-age comedy drama film, and I really liked it. Uh, first and foremost, Craig Robinson uh the comedian i believe he's um i know he's a comedic actor uh, i believe he's also a stand-up comic but i've never seen any of his stand-up or anything like that but i think that's like what he is by trade or whatever um either way funny dude uh this was a a drama uh, comedy drama but more on the drama side i would say with a lot of funny parts sprinkled throughout uh craig robinson did a great job I thought in a serious role, which was like different to see him in. He was all, he actually also played a a serious uh, role in uh, Mr. Robot. The series that I've spoken to you all so highly about. Um, So it was cool to see him in a movie like this. My favorite part of the movie was a long monologue that he he spoke to his son Mo about in the movie uh, towards the end of the movie uh, when they were in the car uh, driving back home and it was a long monologue about his wife I love dialogue I love uh, long monologues and just like like uh, Aaron Sorkin-esque type of back and forth banter like with dialogue I love that stuff so like something like this, which was just, you know, a monologue, just him talking, but for a very long uh, time, what seemed like, you know, what seemed like a long time, um, was, it was really engaging, it, he kind of like drew you into it, it was touching, um, for those of you that haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert, you, and by the way, spoiler alert now for everything and anything that I'm going to speak about, if you haven't seen, I already mentioned to you guys, um, in the little intro thing where I told you guys what I'm going to speak about. If you haven't seen any of that stuff and you don't want to be spoiled, any, anything to be spoiled, then stop listening now. <clears throat> uh, because I'm going to mention a bunch of shit from all those movies and stand-ups or whatever. Anyway. So, for those of you that haven't seen the movie, he... Craig Robinson moves to Germany. He brings his kid along with him. And they don't really get into it, but they mention the fact that he used to play soccer and then became uh, like an assistant coach with like, like the German national soccer team or something like that. But uh, the soccer team like kind of sucks, but it's, it's a job. It's what he does. And that's why he lives in Germany pretty much. But how he wound up there gets gets explained through this monologue and his kid by the way he's like a uh, like an 11 or 12 year old kid and 
it kind of sort of well not kind of sort of gets explained how he wound up um how a black dude wound up in living in germany and at this point by the way his wife uh died i should mention that earlier his wife had passed away and he's like a single dad raising raising his his son the best way that he knows how so in the dialogue it, it mentions how like he he knew his soon-to-be wife or his future wife for not more than three months he used to live in the bronx and she was in germany i forgot why she was in germany but she was like studying in germany or with friends in germany or something like that and he decided on i want to say valentine's day but that could be complete bullshit but he just decided or maybe it was her birthday or something like that he decided um somebody convinced him i I believe to like surprise her and just fly out to germany and he was like completely into this chick and he decided it would be this like romantic you know great type of of gesture to do and and he would wind up getting the girl so he follows this line of thinking flies out to germany doesn't speak any german and thinks apparently that you know germany is like you know a small town or some shit (laughs) because he just flies there and thinks that he's just gonna find her and like just ask somebody i guess you know have you seen a black chick and then like go you know they'll be like oh yeah i saw her you know earlier she's around the corner so he flies out he's describing you know he's nervous he doesn't know uh what he's looking you know how to find her or or whatever so he bumps into a a couple that helps him out a bit and then mentions to the to the kid you know you remember you know joe and susan i don't that's not their real names or whatever but you remember joe and susan you know you met them when you were six or whatever and you know it's a couple that he's still friends with today and mentions how they he asked them you know how to get to the university they actually offered to drive them there and they did and he was like in the university town uh searching for his future wife and to surprise her and um he says how you know he went into restaurants and into into hostels and hotels and little bars and he went everywhere looking for her and and um he was just tearing up that little little town up little town in germany up little college town up and um searching for her, searching for her and then he sees her finally and she's like standing on the corner uh waiting for a cab and she spots him and he says how she turned to him she like her jaw dropped and he was like she looked so amazing she was like the hottest woman in all of germany and that the first thing that she said was i hope you didn't come here for me and then um he was just like quiet i guess whatever and then she just like jumped on him and hugged him and and the rest is history and because of that he stayed in germany started playing soccer apparently be you know was on a soccer team and uh became wound up becoming uh, an assistant coach and moved back to america i'm guessing when when she died i don't think they explained that and then wound up actually wound up moving back to germany for the job for the uh the soccer job or whatever um because the kid grew up for large part in in the states um anyway that that scene that when he's having that that monologue that was like my favorite part of the movie because one it like helps tie the story together you know you're kind of sort of wondering like why they live there um and you know you kind of get the idea that it's because of the job the, the father's job but you don't really get it you know like how do you wind up halfway across the world for a job unless it's like some bonkers you know balling out of control type of job also he he uses that story as a parent to bond with this child who has you know he he seems like a a good kid doesn't get into trouble you know does you know his schoolwork and his father must know that you know it's a tough time for him as well assimilating to to fucking germany you know the kid from the bronx living in germany and the kid actually 
went to like a neighboring uh city or other town or something like that um without the father knowing and uh pretty much got left there by some friends that he was hanging out with and they bounced and he was stranded pretty much and without a cell phone and he called his like german tutor chick and she wanted to tell the father and the father winds up going to pick him up and he was surprised because he called the german chick uh the german tutor chick and was expecting her to show up and she didn't and said the father did so the father knows that the kid's going through some shit and he tells him and you know he tells him this story and the kid by the way he you know went to this town because he's half he has a crush on this like uh you know 15 or 16 year old girl that that's like hanging out with him kind of but um she's into some college guy or some shit like that but he's kind of like into her and whatever so the father winds up telling him this story and explains to him that love will make you do some crazy shit sometimes and he doesn't want to stop him from experiencing stuff or it or any any type of experiences, but that his job is to make sure that he raises him right and uh, keeps him safe and like stuff like that. And that they have to be on the same team for him to be able to do that, um, et cetera. And then the kid opens up and and, you know, because father's like, you know, but you got to speak to me. You got to tell me what the fuck is going on with you. Um, and we have to be on the same team for this all to work. You know, I'm, I know it must be tough for you, and you know, shit is tough for me too. But you know, with the Tony Black dudes and all of fucking Heidelberg, Germany, or whatever the the town was called, you know, we gotta stick together. And the kid is like, "Oh, how'd you know it's about a girl?" And then he was like, "It's always about a girl," or, so, or something like that. So it, it, you know, it was like a bonding scene between father and son, which you all know I'm a sucker for. Um, and. Then the kid is like, the kid tells the dad, um, like towards the end of like the whole exchange, he's like, so I'm not in trouble. And then the dad is like, oh no, you grounded like a motherfucker. <laughs> and like, see, it's like scenes like that, like that's where the comedy like fits in and in the whole comedy drama aspect of the movie or whatever, um, stuff like that, which is hilarious. So I like the story. I like that it's like a snapshot of their lives at a certain point in time when they're just trying to figure it out you know he's trying to figure out how to raise a kid on his own and in germany um and the kid is trying to figure out how to assimilate you know to other kids you know he has his whole world and like at his level and he's he's an interesting takeaway that i took from the movie as well another reason why i really liked it is that i believe that we here in america like we take a lot for granted um even down to like the people that make up our country and we're, we we are all immigrants and we've all um or come from immigrants right you know people that migrated to to the u.s whether it's your parents your grandparents your great-grandparents whatever people we're all fucking immigrants that's what this country is made up of and i feel that intellectually we know that we understand that um but we internalize it as recognizing it from like the outside looking in kind of like we we recognize it as the Dominican bodega owner or the Middle Eastern cab driver or the Portuguese construction worker. And this movie does a great job of showing us what that immigrant experience is like versus, you know, just our perception of what the the experience is like by showing us you know, quote, one of ours being the immigrant and assimilating somewhere else, in this case, Germany. So I think we get a, a, like a different view of what it's like to be an immigrant here by seeing what it would be like for one of us, quote unquote, being an immigrant somewhere else. And that was pretty dope. And then lastly, with the movie, it's interesting to see how at least a uh, something that i picked up i could be like reading too much into it or whatever but whatever it's all about what you get from things right um how they your behavioral traits affect your your children or those around you so the father you know followed this girl to germany wound up staying in germany living in germany for the girl you know he got to you know live there did made his life there 
and got a job there and that's where he lives um because of that one decision that he made that followed you know that path and he pretty much you know he i guess he went back to the states wound up coming back for the job and he it kind of sort of shows him like sticking to what he knows and you know we all do that to some degree and then the kid kind of like copies that that trait of sticking with what you know with um he's like into hip-hop and he wants to be a rapper when he grows up um but and nobody around him you know all the the little white german kids are into like techno and edm and like that type of shit and nobody's into hip-hop um they barely know what it is but he sticks to what he knows and and true to his like love of hip-hop and this is my thing type of thing this is what i know and this is you know this isn't gonna let me down and i'm gonna stick to it so that's um similar to his pops you know sticking to soccer and and coaching soccer and stuff like that and sticking to what he knows so i feel like that's something that's like a trait a behavioral trait that that you can possibly pass on by the way i'm not a wine guy but i'm sipping on some fucking yellowtail white wine moscato and shit's pretty fucking good i gotta say anyway (laughs) more is from america uh that's my take on it i recommend it and you guys should check it out next is the accountant the accountant with ben affleck ben affleck did a did a good job in this movie i think he's a pretty good actor he gets a lot of shit but i i've always thought he was a fine actor you know not like my favorite actor or anything like that but he's just a, a good actor um i like this movie because i like i like there being conversation around things that are different things that are are fascinating or or even it doesn't even have to be fascinating to me like just some like if there's a conversation about i don't know pick something boring like how to make wine orators or something like that like there's a a a deep dive conversation into that like the art of making an orator um that's i'm glad that that type of conversation is happening because that's how we wind up with dope shit and that's how we learn more about things and about ourselves and about stuff and and whatever so this movie is about autism and or i don't know if you, you want to say it's just about autism but the main character ben affleck is autistic and um i'm glad to see that movie like that hit the mainstream the way it did and it was a good movie it was entertaining to watch there was a ton of action dope action tate fletcher's in this movie by the way powerful tate fletcher for those that don't know a former mma fighter and turned actor tate fletcher uh pirate life radio podcast uh what was i gonna say he's been in a ton he like all the action movies like um what else was he in the uh that keanu reeves movie that that's like part two is coming out and part one is actually surprisingly good um tate fletcher was in that he's in he's like the big buff fucking bad guy he was in breaking bad he was in a bunch of shit anyway the accountant back to like the whole autism thing aside from the fact that the movie was good and entertaining and kept you engaged uh throughout it um just the topic of autism being explored in any way i like and some people say that autism may be like a glimpse into the next level of human evolution and i can't say i'm fully on board with that thought or claim or whatever um but some some of the things that some autistic people can do is are is just like amazing like for example um and well before the example and there's also things you know people that suffer from autism that have debilitating traits um and it's horrible you know it's a it's a obviously a wide spectrum and I suspect that we're all on it in in some way on, on that type of spectrum. Just, you know, most of us are on the quote-unquote normal side of it. 
or I guess like more balance side of it, or, you know, we could hide our little quirks more than others and, and tendencies, et cetera. Um, but some autistic people do things that are like nothing short of like amazing, like superpower ish, amazing. Um, there's an example that I like of Stephen uh, Wilshire, who's an autistic artist savant. And I'll put a clip of him in the episode notes. Um, he's this dude that can draw things from memory. Like you can just look at something, see it, and and not like, I don't know, not like a Mickey Mouse and then draw the Mickey Mouse. Like he literally drew the entire New York City, not just the skyline, not just like, you know, the Empire State Building and the, the Freedom Tower, um, like the entire... New York City, Manhattan from memory and like the bridges the buildings the number of windows per building the fucking ripples in the in the Hudson River and the waves and like every single thing like s- amazing like that and it took him like three days to do and he did it like from memory and it's just fascinating to me to to think that the human brain is capable of things like that and you know we find out about it through um you know someone being wired quote unquote incorrectly or you know not normally and and it's just interesting as shit man we're weird people man and there's a bunch of different things like like synesthesia which i've mentioned before i think that uh i think i've mentioned it before um pharrell has synesthesia which is some sort of brain wiring that gets crisscrossed like in terms of like the five senses so there's people that can literally taste colors like if they see the color red they get like a certain taste in their mouth or people that can that hear this is what Pharrell has it in this way that he hears sounds as colors so it's kind of like when he's putting beats together and stuff like that, he's seeing like a melody of colors and by putting the colors together in a certain way helps him make the beats that he makes, that he produces. Um, And there's a lot of weird shit like that, man, that goes on. Uh, Brain Stuff, by the way, the podcast that I mentioned to you guys in the past as well, has done an episode on synesthesia. So you guys should check that out. And, you know, those podcasts are like less than 10 minutes long. So it's pretty cool if you guys want to check it out. Uh, but anyway, the accountant. Aside from that stuff, it it was dope, and uh, I recommend it as well. So check it out. And actually, let me segue into the next one by mentioning from the accountant that um, it's like is Warren Buffett technically autistic, but just with like finance shit, or is like Mike Zuckerberg autistic with computer coding? It's like I don't know. I don't know, man. Interesting to to think about, at least. Anyway, that said, Becoming Warren Buffett is the next movie that I'm going to speak about. Uh, It was a documentary that HBO released. And he's fucking great. He's He's definitely the type of human being that you would, or I would, uh, like, aspire to want to wanna be when I'm his age. And, and, uh, not just at his age, you know. Shit, I'll take $50 billion right now. But, nah, I'm definitely not speaking about the money part, although that would be obviously amazing. And and just to have success within within the something that you love, um, that aspect of it would be so dope. But just like the dope... Uh, like the humble, caring type of person that he seems to be obviously i don't know him personally and not just from this from this documentary but a lot of interviews that i've seen with him he, he has a, a cool interview by the way with uh with a, a forbes interview with jay-z that's old i'm sure you guys have seen it but if not check it out it's on youtube uh, but just many like clips that i've seen of his and um his uh letters letter he does a yearly letter to to berkshire that's all like public i've skimmed through a bunch of them 
in the past a uh, yearly letter to the uh, shareholders and you guys can just google and look up like in the finance world people like speak about them a lot i'll actually look for the latest one and uh add it to the episode notes for you guys um but just kind of that i can't put my finger on it but it's just like the i know i'm the best at this i know i'm the like the dawn of this whole shit but i never will rub your face in it you know what i mean like I, I'll, I'll never be the, like that type of douchebag just let me do my thing and continue being the goat you know what i mean like that type of approach that he seems to have um is endearing and i strive for that um something interesting that i took away from this documentary is that i feel that he he's so like he, he even says it and this is why i was saying like you know is warren buffett um autistic when it comes to finance shit like he even says it he's like that his brain is wired in a way that he loves numbers and he can't get enough of them and he's and he sees patterns within the stock market and and by the way for anybody who doesn't know warren buffett is like literally one of the richest if not the richest um man in the world um and he's from omaha nebraska born and raised and still lives in omaha nebraska in the house that he purchased like in the 50s or, or something like that he still lives in the same house which is a very nice house but it's you know it's not this like castle with a moat around it you know what i mean it's like a um a, a nice un- but unassuming home and he is you know constantly you know top one two or three richest person in the world uh back and forth with like bill gates and which is a good friend of his and people like that. So anyway, he says that, you know, his brain is wired in a way that constantly keeps him like engaged in this, in, in, in finance stuff. And his father was a stockbroker for a while. And he used to read, he read like all the books that his dad had on finance when he was like seven or 11 or something like that. Then he used to, he went to the library, the Omaha local library and literally read every single book on finance and stocks um while he was like a little kid and it was something that he was always like drawn to since he since he was little so he says that you know there's nothing special about what he does there is you know all the information that he reads is available to to anyone and everyone as you know is mandated by like the sec and all that shit is public information you can literally look up um all the stuff that he reads and that you know, different financial analysts read and stuff like that and what companies are doing and how much they sold and this and that and, you know, just full prospectuses that are literally like three to 500 page documents that have the ins and outs of every single aspect of a stock or a bond, etc. It's all public information. Um, He, however, is someone that actually reads through all this shit for, he says, I think he reads like six to 10 hours a day and that takes a certain type of discipline and passion that is admirable and is why he is who he is. You know, he's willing to put in that work aside from the fact that, you know, he's obviously like gifted or, or, you know, wired for it as he puts it. And he's very calculated, very measured, very, very even keeled. It seems like, um, definitely within the, the finance world and he's a, a long investor meaning that he doesn't he's not looking for the uh the stocks that will or the company that will you know turn a quick profit he's like in it for the long haul he's an investor in companies like american express and coca-cola and like railroads and you know um, what like the washington post like institutional like you know print newspapers something something that shows i i felt like his human side uh in watching this documentary and something that i noticed is that some of the biggest decisions that he made were completely driven by emotion which is kind of like diametrically opposed to how he acts within the 
his work, his passion, you know, finance and how, how willing he is to say, this is my strategy and I'm going to stick to the strategy for 30 years, no matter what, even though the market tanked in 2008, like he still stayed, um, you know, with his, with his strategy. And, um, now looking back at it, he regained uh, certain ground and is, you know, back on top and one of the winningest investors in all of Wall Street. So, but these, there's two specific times that I felt that he did two things that were driven purely by emotion and that kind of, kind of changed his life and changed the trajectory of it. So for what, it, for what it's worth, these are the two things that, that I noticed. One is when his father died. So he mentions how he he purchased stock in Berkshire Hathaway and it was a like a failing company uh, Berkshire Hathaway by the way is the name of his like investment company but but it wasn't like an investment company at the time it was I forget what it was it was some sort of like factory or something like that but it was like closing factories and he was just like buying stocks in it because he knew that they would have to like close enough factories to like repurchase stocks and then in doing so the stock price would go up or something like that some weird like financial maneuvering and he wasn't wrong so he um like purchased this stock and then in his company and then he told like the the shareholding management or or whatever the board that he would sell it at like 17 17 dollars or 17 and a half dollars or something like that that's a sale price and then they came back and they sold it at like 17 dollars or they tried to fuck him out of like some money but like in a dirty way like that and he got so pissed that he wound up like buying and a shit you know enough stock to to be the majority owner of the company and then he got rid of the entire the the entire board and and put in a a new management team basically and that's how he acquired uh berkshire hathaway which is now the name that's pretty much synonymous with with warren buffett and in the documentary he mentions how he didn't realize it at the time but that his father had passed away um like five days before then and that he feels that that had something to do with his irrational way of of acting. But obviously it turned out to be like an amazing thing for him, even though, you know, he would have gone on to do other things and, you know, we just wouldn't know the name Berkshire Hathaway. It would have been Warren Buffett's fucking investing co or something like that. Um, but I found that interesting. Then the second um emotional decision that that i felt drove a very significant turning point in his life i'm gonna mention in a second so he before i mention it he you know he knew he had this gift for money he's not he's a very unassuming person like i said he lives in the house that he bought like when uh in the 50s or something like that he still lives in it to this day he fucking eats McDonald's for breakfast on his five minute drive to the office in Omaha, Nebraska, where he again was born, raised and still lives. And his wife was, which was a, she was into like philanthropy and he was always doing, she was always doing volunteer work and, and part of the the civil rights movement and he pretty he he stated that he he knew that that's where and they would butt heads a bit um with how much money he was donating to like charities and stuff like that because she wanted to donate you know much more um and he is like heavy on like compound compound interest and the way it works is like the more you know, the more you save, the more you put into into it, the more it compounds and the more it becomes. So if you give too much away now, it'll be, you know, far less later than what it could be. Um, so, you know, they, they always butt heads and she, you know, she understood that, the like the long-term view again, the long-term view on that whole thing. 
and the way he saw it was pretty much that he would amass this you know huge wealth of money you know she was younger than him she would outlive him and then you know where her heart is is in you know giving back and she's the best person to do so um so he would stack the money up and she would divvy it up and it would be better off for humanity pretty much unfortunately his wife passed away uh before he did and you know before you know he hasn't passed away so um but his wife passed away before him and he this is the second emotional decision that i felt that he made when his wife did die that's when he made the single greatest donation to charity than anyone has ever done in history and i think it was something like I don't know, like 99% or 98% of his entire fortune, which is literally tens of billions of dollars, um, he donated to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which again, uh, is a good friend of his, and Bill and and Melinda Gates have, have, um, they're deep in that foundation shit. And he felt like, you know, who better than a friend of mine that I know is is going to do the right thing with this money, and he donated the the bulk of his fortune to them, and as well as to his three children who have their own foundations and their own charity charities uh, going on, and um, he's just an amazing individual to do something like that. I definitely respect that, and highly recommend it. So. Check it out. It's called Becoming Warren Buffett on HBO. He's not a piece of shit like Ray Kroc. I'll tell you that. So, (laughs) The Founder, the movie The Founder, is about the, quote-unquote, the founder of McDonald's, the franchise, the fast food joint that poisons all of us. I could definitely go for some McDonald's fries right now and an apple pie. Um, so Ray Kroc was played by Michael Keaton, who did a dope job. Michael Keaton's the man. I like him. He's a great actor. And the founder is about, uh, Ray Kroc, who I thought before seeing this movie was the person that, you know, started McDonald's or whatever. He started the McDonald's that we all know, but he didn't start McDonald's. He stole McDonald's. He's a fucking thief. A piece of shit thief. This is the type of, of like, Steve Jobs-esque type of douchebag that I hate within the business world. Like, I don't like people like this. Like, the, the people that are like, well, to get ahead, you gotta fuck people. I'm like, no, you don't. You piece of shit. You don't have to fuck anybody over to get ahead you could get ahead by fucking people over but that doesn't mean that that's the only way to get ahead um so in short pretty much ray Kroc, who's like a struggling salesman in his like 40s or 50s or something like that by the time he stumbles on this gold mine um this is how it was depicted in the movie i haven't done any like fact checking behind it to see you know it's a movie based on the true story but I don't know, you know, movies like that, they always take liberties with shit. But within this movie, they they show that he's a struggling salesman. He stumbles upon these two brothers, uh, something and something McDonald, who started a, a burger spot. And, you know, they used to have like a hot dog spot and, a, you know, just a, a restaurant, a food restaurant, and then yeah, transitioned over the years into this burger spot. Because they realized that the most of um, the revenue was coming from burger, uh, soft drinks, and fries or something like that. Like the sales of those three things. So they cut everything else off the menu. And the younger brother seemed to be like a bit autistic. He was like very, very, uh, if you haven't noticed, autism is like the, the theme of this podcast, I guess. He was very uh, like OCD with with like planning things out and... And trying to make things as efficient as possible. So he found the most efficient way to make burgers and, you know, make the three things that that sell. And he dubbed it, like, the speedy food system or something like that. The speedy rack. And 
pretty much compartmentalized all portions of making the fast food so instead of one person making an entire hamburger like one person would work on the patty one person would add the the ketchup and and whatever on it somebody else would add the pickles on it somebody else would do fries somebody else would do this somebody else would you know man the the orders etc so uh ray Kroc stumbled upon this you know he long story short convinced them to franchise it and give them give them the ability to franchise more and ray Kroc started like selling this shit like hotcakes and they went national it went worldwide um and ray Kroc eventually by the recommendation of an attorney that he wanted bumping into started he created something called the mcdonald corporation company now it wasn't you know he wasn't the owner of mcdonald's he signed the contract saying that he you know he wasn't the owner or whatever he was just a franchisee uh, franchising the idea of the two brothers but he started something called the mcdonald corporation which was a quote-unquote leasing company so ray Kroc was selling like these mcdonald's franchises to a bunch of people but he wasn't making any money off of them but those people were making money but his cut was like too low to like make any money any real money so what he did was instead of leasing instead of you know leaving it up to the individual franchisees to go find like a place to lease he would buy the land he bought the land that the people were uh the franchisees were building mcdonald's on so if somebody came to him and says yes i'm down i'll do a franchise he'd be like okay good i have a i have a, a spot here that you could build on and then in essence becoming like the landlord so he started making buku bucks and um long story short one of fucking the two brothers out of it out of the mcdonald's name because he pretty much became the face of it you know hundreds of franchisees knew him as like the guy that started it nobody knew who the fuck the two brothers were and he made an offer to the to the uh two brothers after one of them had a heart attack he was an opportunistic piece of shit that wound up you know going to them in the hospital and instead of giving his condolences or sorry or whatever because the guy literally had a heart attack from like arguing with him over the phone he uh goes there and offers them uh money to to completely buy the mcdonald's name or whatever and he does and he did and a key a key scene to me in this movie was ray Kroc was on the phone with one of the two brothers and he was explaining to them how you know this is business this is war it's war out there and business is war war is business and it's a doggy dog world and if you had to you know would you make the profits you need to make and et cetera, blah 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 and would you do what you had to do in order to to make a buck and and you know he pays he paints like that dim ugly picture of business that that i've always disliked and the brother reacts to him and he he just responds to him and he was like no i wouldn't want to i wouldn't want that and then he hangs up on on ray Kroc, and i love that scene because it's kind of like it shows like the juxtaposition between two two individuals and how one is like just driven by like that that whatever that those aspirations are and that greed and that money and that power and that like soul it's okay to want like a better station in life it's okay to want like a, a nicer place to live or or a nicer car and stuff like that but when you're solely only driven by more and more and more and i want more like there's something like innately wrong about that and it's cool to see that even though in even in the eyes of like defeat um within like the business business realm like that like the brother still like stood his ground and and was true to himself and he was like no actually i wouldn't fucking want that you dick anyway it's called the founder and i recommend it you guys should definitely check it out and oh the so ray Kroc like the piece of shit that he was he uh 
like his wife he like divorced her or something one of like marrying you know his wife that was with him like through thick and thin no matter what divorced her and married some some other guy's wife that that he he always had an eye for and i wonder if that was true well anyway in the movie he was a piece of grade a piece of shit <laughs> um and he did that and also he bought the uh the mcdonald's name from the mcdonald brothers for like 1.3 million dollars each so it'll be like one million dollars each after taxes and at that time the equivalent of that would be like 10 million dollars each um and then they were supposed to get like one percent of sales like in perpetuity like forever after that and ray Kroc told him that you know we'll do that part like as a handshake deal um here's the check for a million bucks each or whatever um you guys will definitely get that money but i can't put that in the contract because of legal issues and blah 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 blah. they pretty much agreed to it and obviously got fucked and they never saw a penny of that money like the of the like one percent they just got their million bucks each and it is what it is now mcdonald's is poisoning children all across the globe probably forever only two movies left folks and then three stand-up comedy specials <laughs> That's a lot of shit, huh? All right. The next movie is going to be a little surprising. It's a cartoon movie because my wife loves cartoon movies. And I'll have to say, I, I was, I've been into a few of them. I like a few of them. Uh, this one actually is one of them that I liked. Maona was pretty cool. And the biggest takeaway that I got from, from this is... Although I, I don't know like how or why I never like noticed this before, but it's kind of genius the way they do movies, like kids movies, because it's not like, you know, like kids cartoons or whatever. Like, like I've seen a couple lately, like have them on like for like my nieces or whatever, or my niece, the other one's still like too small to like watch or whatever, but they like they're like just for kids like there's no there's no like bigger meaning or anything like that but i noticed like that with these movies like movies like mona they're like the genius of them is that the the parent the parents will watch them with their kids and you know like little kids aren't like going to movies by themselves to watch them and or you know they watch them at home and they come out on dvd and stuff they they're and the parents are a significant piece of that viewership pie. And they're the ones with the money, you know, paying for the kids to go. So it, it's good to, like, hook them up with something, like a takeaway from the movies. And there's a lot in them that are, like, for the parents. It's like they're simple movies, but they're meaningful. Like, they have, like, a like deeper meaning to them. Like, this movie was big on, uh, like, Mona was this little Hawaiian girl that that had an affinity for like wanting to travel the seas but she was supposed to be like the next chief of her tribe after her father passed and they have to stay like on the island and they can't go past the water and like stuff like that they can't go sailing and um they were big on like the harmony between the people and the land and and being one with the land and taking care of the land and the, the land takes care of you and gives you everything that you, that you need and in terms of like food and water and and stuff like that and the fish from the sea and and um a large part of the movie has to do with one guy that that was played by the rock uh dwayne johnson which is funny by the way um that was played by him that stole the heart of the sea quote unquote which was some like stone gem thing and uh, because of that, it brought like this harmony to the to the uh, to the island, etc. So, like the metaphor there was like we're stealing from from Mother Earth, like we're stealing, you know, by by the emissions that we put out and 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 drilling for oil and and over overfishing and stuff like that. Like we're stealing from Mother Earth, and we're not we're not in harmony with her, and we're taking we're spoiled we're taking much more than our fair share and it's detrimental to uh, the long-term sustainability of the earth and in the movie there's like this this 
the big antagonist that that they have to like fight at the end is this huge angry lava monster and the lava monster it turns out spoiler alert is actually mother earth and mother earth was just pissed off and full of lava and fire and angry and pissed and was gonna fucking kill anything in sight and then when they returned the heart of mother earth like the little gem thing that 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 the rock stole initially then mother earth was at peace and then started giving back to her and all her people and and stuff like that um and it was dope it was it was it was a pretty cool movie you guys should check it out if, you, if you're into stuff like that um like i said it was funny there was uh there was a really funny song which by the way my wife told me i haven't fact checked any of this but my wife told me that lin manuel miranda wrote um some of the music um uh for this movie so that's pretty dope lin, lin manuel miranda is the the dude that uh wrote the play in the heights which i've seen and hamilton which i have not seen and one of the songs uh, that The Rock sings is is funny. He's like, it's called You're Welcome. And he's just like saying, you're welcome after everything. And like he's God's gift to the world type of thing. And it's a funny song. Um, Maybe I'll see if I could play it like at the end of this episode. Uh, during the credits. Uh, during the uh, sponsorship phase of the episode or whatever. Um, What else about this movie? Tafiti. Tafiti, I learned, is a Polynesian word that means a faraway place. Um, I kind of took it as like a metaphor, metaphorically meaning not just a faraway place, but a faraway goal, like something you're trying to obtain. Um, and also, uh, lastly, reincarnation was a big part of of like this um, culture and. It was implicit in, in, like the grandmother in the story coming back, as a stingray, which is the tattoo that she got, and it was like her choice. Um, I thought that was interesting. It was her choice to get that tattoo because that's what she wanted to come back as. So, it's like so understood that you are going to come back as something, that you get a tattoo of what you want to come back as, and you come back as it. Um. So that was interesting too that was an interesting thing and that was it it's called Maona M-A-O-N-A uh, check it out oh and they had little minions <laughs> but like in the form of coconuts like you know the minions from from what's that fucking cartoon movie which was good also I think there was two or three of them um Despicable Me those movies the little yellow minions like they have in my own, I'd like their version of, which is kind of like biting off of them, but it, they were cool. It was funny too. Um, instead of minions, they were like little uh, coconuts, coconuts that could walk and talk and fight, and they were like angry little fuckers, and they were like pirates pretty much. Um, <laughs> so it was kind of funny. And that's it. One more movie, and then we'll go to the three stand-up specials, and then end the episode. Doctor Strange is the last movie that I've seen that I'm going to speak about in this episode. And there was a really good scene. I, I liked the movie. I thought it was pretty good. This is, too many people bitch about superhero movies. Like, it's so unrealistic and this and that. It's a fucking superhero movie. Like, no shit, it's unrealistic. Anyway, Doctor Strange, I thought it was pretty good. One thing that I found annoying at first... But then kind of like refreshing, like I, I appreciate them taking like the chances with it is like the the comedy aspect that's woven into these superhero movies now. Like like uh, Deadpool was like straight comedy. It was like mad funny like throughout. Um, but it was the first time I kind of saw that like levity within a, a superhero movie. And then in Doctor Strange, like they had like little scenes like that were like Deadpoolish as well that I thought played pretty well. And just like with mentioning Doctor Strange is like telling some like Buddhist monk dude 
like oh what's your name and he tells him and then it's just like a one name and he was like oh so it's like like adele you know like a one name and the guy's looking at him like what the fuck is adele and he's like you never heard of adele how about drake eminem bono you know he was like saying stuff like that it was like funny shit like that it was pretty cool um the what was dope visually this is what i like the most about the movie it was visually visually really awesome with the the style of the uh manipulation inception style surrounding manipulation you know like in the movie inception when like the buildings bend and like stuff like that there's a lot of that going on in this movie and i think it took it like to the next level of that whatever that style of of cinematography or whatever it's called and that was really cool also um the scene where he meets the bald buddha lady is what i imagine a dmt trip is like and you know it's been like i've heard of what the experience is like like on different podcasts and stuff like that and i feel like i want one of those people like an aubrey marcus or something like that to like see this and be like because it's always described as something that words would never be able to explain um no matter how you explain it words will never do it justice and i think we all experience things like that um in our lives not like a dmt trip but just like things that we can't really like express uh, because there's literally just no words for it it's kind of like a you have to you had to have been there or you have to like see it to believe it type of thing and i wanted i just want to know how closely this scene when he meets the buddha lady and she like it pushes him through like different dimensional you through different dimensions of the universe and wormholes and like weird shit and fractals you know happening and stuff like that i want to know how close that is to describing what a true dmt trip is like um because that's the first thing that i thought of when i saw that scene which was just cool visually to like look at it seemed pretty awesome and what else the the last thing that i liked about this movie is that you know he's like this hot shot uh neuro um not neurosurgeon i think i guess yeah neurosurgeon brain surgeon guy doctor and he is you know like very scientific and she's like this buddha monk master you know woo woo type of you know 13 dimensions exist and the world isn't what it seems type of lady and you know the power of the mind type of thing and when he's finally like accepting it accepting it to be an actual thing and not just bullshit um and she's showing him how to you know create portals with your mind and go into different places and you got to do this with your hand and you create a portal into a different dimension type of type of thing or a different part of the world that you can go to just by walking through it and he asks her you know even if i do do this with my hands and even if i do buy the whole thing like I, i'll still be just waving my hands in the air like how do i get from here to there to where you are and she asks him how did you become one of the greatest surgeons in brain surgeons in the world and that could reattach you know nerve endings from the spinal cord to to the brain etc and his response was years and years of study and practice like years of it many many years of it and she kind of looked at him like yeah that's how like in other words saying the way to answer your question the way you get from there to here to have the ability to to you know do these portals and fucking go through them into different dimensions is through years and years of study and practice like there's no secret sauce to it like you just got to do it and i love hearing stuff like that even if it's within this fake you know movie world or whatever but just like that sentiment of it always takes hard work and deliberate practice to get to where you want to be i love shit like that i eat shit like that up anyway 
Doctor Strange, another movie that I highly recommend. And that said, those are all the movies I had to speak about. And I'm already at an hour in this episode, and I got to tell you guys about three stand-up comedy specials. So I'm going to speed it up just a tad. Uh, Not too much, though, not to not do it justice. But anyway, I'm going to start off with literally my favorite single most thing that I've watched in a long time. And by single most thing that I've watched in a long time, I mean like as a body of work compared to movies, TV series, other stand-up comedy specials, anything. Three Mics by Neil Brennan is the best thing that I've seen in a long time, including all the movies that I just mentioned, all the movies that I've mentioned in the past or other stand-up comedy specials, etc., etc., it's called three mics because there's literally three mics on stage and he does three distinctly different things throughout the the stand-up performance it's available on netflix by the way and i put a the trailer to it within the episode notes if you guys want to check it out um so there's three mics one is for one-liners one is just straight stand-up and another one is emotional stuff. For those of you that don't know who Neil Brennan is, he is a stand-up comic, uh, headlining comic, and he is the co-creator of The Chappelle Show uh, with Dave Chappelle. He was his writing partner in that show between the two of them. They equally produced it, uh, you know, wrote all the sketches and stuff like that. Um, uh, he's also directed like Nike commercials and he's like the voice for like Samsung commercials and stuff like that. He does voiceover work and he's a really funny and versatile talented dude. He's a writer also. Um he's written on other TV shows, etc. So, he's definitely he's a talented dude and I just thought that this performance was really thought out really really thought out really thoughtful um it was funny obviously he's a really funny guy it was deep um especially with the like emotional stuff which uh he was really open and honest about um it showed his his versatility and it was just like an emotional roller coaster like you're laughing you um he's like uh clinically depressed person like um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not like he's sad all the time, but like, you know, like, oh, it's raining out. I'm sad. Um, but like clinically takes medication, certified, depressed or whatever. I don't know how to explain it more than that. Um, and it was just, it was, I've, I saw it once and I've seen uh, different clips of it after and I definitely it's it's one that that's worth a second and third watch and I'm definitely gonna watch it again probably soon like I said it's my favorite thing that I've seen in a long time and it might not be something that you're into but if you are if you like stand up if you like um if you like I don't know just like taking a deep dive into somebody else's like emotional world and someone's head and in a very creative and thought out thoughtful way then uh check it out it's called the three mics by neil brennan and it's on netflix next is felipe sparza's they're not gonna laugh at you felipe sparza is also a headlining stand-up comedian i think he's a headliner but he's definitely a funny funny comic um well he's definitely a headliner um I stumbled on his special. I've I've heard him on different podcasts, and I've never seen any of his stand up. He's been on uh, Joey Diaz's uh, Church of What's Happening Now, and I believe he's also been on um, a, a Christchurch podcast, the Burkcast. I think, but I definitely heard him mentioned in comedic circles, and I saw it. It was on Netflix. Decided to to check it out. It was from like 2012, and. I was pleasantly surprised. It was funny. It was it was literally laugh laugh out loud funny. And 
the the title of it was or is of the special uh they're not gonna laugh at you and he got that name from his mother because he told his mom that that um you know he's a mexican dude his mom um assuming he's like a mexican immigrant and he's like first generation uh mexican american and his his uh, he said that he like told his mom that he's gonna like film this thing special and stuff like that and his mom um you know being a caring mom was like don't worry then um it, everything's gonna go great they're not gonna laugh at you and you know what i mean like she kind of meant that like you know nobody's gonna like make fun of you for doing it you're gonna do great type of thing but it's like the whole point of the comedy show is for them to laugh <laughs> and um that's why he named it they're not gonna laugh at you so i thought that was pretty funny and that was pretty cool and the the episode this is the only thing you have to get over um if you can get past the the way he sounds no offense uh to felipe esparza but he sounds like the mexican accent that everyone that tries to do a fake mexican accent does he sounds that way like normally like you know like that orale carnal que onda güey pinche cabrón like he sounds like that and if you can get past that for an hour and a half or i'm sorry for an hour um stand-up special you'll enjoy it um and it's very very like punch joke punch joke punch joke um it's very like that very paced very like high paced like that throughout the whole thing so you'll if you don't laugh at one you'll laugh at the next one or the one right after that that's coming like in fucking 20 seconds so check it out felipe esparza's they're not gonna laugh at you that is available on netflix and last but not least the king of comedy himself probably is right now bill burr at least to me bill burr's new special is available on netflix it's called walk your way out and it's awesome of course Bill Burr is definitely a master at his craft and he's the best kind like we we've spoken about in this episode you know he's humble self-deprecating um definitely non-Ray Crockish and um and he kills it I didn't like it as much as his last special but but take that with a huge grain of salt I'll tell you why it's great it's a five-star special absolutely um but i went to see him live when he came to new york and he played at msg and sold the fucking crowd out um and not in the little theater by the way it was the like the stadium um he i saw him live and some of the jokes from the special like a a few like big bits like big chunks of it were um i heard them when i saw them live so just because they you know that element of surprise like wasn't there the you know i that's what i'm saying i quote unquote liked it less than the previous special of his but it was you know nothing short of uh, fantastic it was is a great special definitely recommend it and you guys should definitely check it out again bill burr's new special is called walk your way out and um bill burr actually recently had a kid i don't know if i mentioned that in a previous episode but he had a kid with his the lovely nia like he calls her and um many blessings to to them and their uh, growing family it's pretty dope i say dope a lot and i think i say more when i'm on the podcast i don't know why and then I do like in fucking regular life. All right. So that's the episode, folks. That's episode 67 of the Sponsor Day podcast. Thank you very much for sticking around. And if you want to stick around for another like five to 10 minutes, I'm just going to zoom, 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 zoom through a couple of uh, house cleaning stuff. The outro where I tell you guys a bunch of different ways you can help support the podcast if you want to stick around, stick around. And if not, peace. Check out the next episode. So, so one of the 